Welcome to Life Worship Center. We are a Pentecostal church that is passionate about Jesus. Now, as a church, our mission is to always be reaching. We want to be reaching up to find intimacy with God. We want to be reaching in to find unity with God's people. And we want to be reaching out for the world that God loves. Now, I pray that you'll join right in with us from home today and worship the Lord with us in spirit and in truth. I'm so excited to bring to you an encouraging and an uplifting message from the Word of God today. Thanks again for joining us, and let's go live at Life Worship Center. Hallelujah. Come on, he's worthy. Thank you, Jesus. Hallelujah. So good. Amen. Can we welcome Pastor Gary? Amen. Why just close your eyes? Let's just stay in this heart of worship for just a minute. I just want to. I want to worship Him like you're not here. Can I do that? Will y'all just give me the freedom to do that? Where the Spirit of the Lord is, there's freedom, and you all are Spirit-filled people, right? I love you, Jesus. You're so good, Father. You're so good. Thank you for every opportunity I have to worship you, Lord. Thank you, Father, for the blessings, for the freedom that comes, Lord. For rivers rivers God rivers of living water thank you Holy Spirit for filling us with love we do not have a spirit of fear but one that is of love one that is of power one that is of a sound mind God thank you for clarity thank you God for sobriety in the body of Christ you Lord you declared that if your eye be single then our whole body would be full of light and God you declared that a double-minded man is unstable in all his ways and any man who is of that nature should not expect to receive anything from the Lord we don't want to be double-minded we want to be single-eyed. We want every eye to be gazed, <laughs> to be fixed upon you today, Lord. I'm not here to be seen. I'm not just here to minister to your people. I'm here to minister to you, Father. I just, I'm going to sing a different song right quick because I just feel this. <sighs> mm. There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. And I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you. Come on, do y'all know that? There is none like you. No one else can touch my heart like you do. And I could search for all eternity long and find there is none like you <laughs> I want to be like you I want to break every chain in this room <laughs> cause I am yours and Jesus you are mine too so I I want to be like you. Mm. I so want to be like you, Lord.
You know, sometimes when we say we want to be like Jesus, everybody talks about how impossible that is. Everybody talks about how that's arrogant, you know. When I say I want to be like Jesus, I'm not saying it from a place of arrogance. I'm saying it from a place of sonship. I'm saying I want to be like my father. And I believe that according to the gospel, I have the right to be. Because in John chapter 1, it says that any of those who believe upon him, he gave them the privilege to be known as children of God. Sons and daughters of the living God. Holy Spirit, come and have your way. Just stay in this atmosphere of worship. Stay in this atmosphere of worship. I feel like He has His own message for every person here. They could all be very different. And a lot of times we, we rely on the preacher. We rely on the anointing of of the pastor, on the prophet, on the evangelist, on the preacher, on the teacher. We, we, we rely on those offices. We rely on the, the anointing of other people. But I feel like the Lord wants me to tell you this morning that it's just as important for you to be anointed to hear as it is for someone else to be anointed to preach. I felt the fear of the Lord come into this place this morning. And I almost want to just be completely quiet, but I feel the Spirit prompting me to tell you, press in, press in. Hear what God is speaking to you. Listen to what He's saying. Peter said, Where else would we go, Lord? For in You are the words of eternal life. Peter was saying, Lord, where else would we go when You speak? We become alive inside. If you could just hear His voice this morning. Many of you who feel blank, who feel dead, who feel empty, who feel cold, who feel weak, who feel like you're in a stale place, a place of complacency, I'm telling you, if you'll press in and hear what the Lord is saying to you, He will create new life inside of you. He will stir your heart beyond comprehension. We say, do it, Lord. Do it, Lord. Let's do it again, Michael. Let's sing it again, brother. verse 20 says oh you angels who excel in strength heeding the voice of God's word 
I love the fact that in that passage, it's not just restricted to the voice of God, but it's the voice of God's Word. And this morning, I just want to pray, and I want you to pray with me. I want, I want us as a body to pray for angels to invade the room of Pastor April this morning. I don't know where she is. I don't know what she's doing, but God knows. Lord, I just pray that You would send ministers of the Spirit. Your ministers to go and minister to Pastor April this morning for peace, for purpose, for clarity. I know she has assurance, Father. I know she knows where her mom is. I know that, God, I know that this is a family who serves you. They love you. They have peace that goes beyond understanding. But Father, I just want you to touch her today. I just want you to give her joy. Father, I pray that you give her visions and dreams of her mom with you in heaven. <laughs> yeah. Do it, Lord. Give her visions and dreams of her mom with you. I pray for others in the church right now who are still struggling with the broken heart of losing a loved one. God, I pray that you give them peace. I pray for heavenly encounters, for heavenly visions to come. For ministers of the Spirit to invade their room when they're all alone and no one else is around and you soften their heart and you grip their soul <laughs> and you show them how good you are. Thank you for your goodness, Father. Thank you for the richness of your love. For blessed assurance. Hallelujah. For blessed assurance, we praise You today, Father. We praise You and we thank You, Lord, in Your holy name. And all God's people said, Amen. Amen. You may be seated. I won't keep you much longer, but... How many of you... How many of you experienced the presence of the Lord this morning? Amen. Give Him a... Yeah, go ahead and bless Him. I, I don't... I mean, I don't... I don't, <laughs> I don't care about entertaining anybody. I don't care if anybody thinks I'm a good preacher. I ain't trying to pastor no church. I just want His presence. I want it so bad that I believe that if I can walk into a room with people like you all and go after Him, He'll just show up. Because that's what He does. The Bible says that we are to enter into His gates with thanksgiving. And we enter into His courts with praise. It's in Psalm 100. And I really believe that that's the protocol for God's presence. I know that we've preached so much. You know that we come before the Lord broken. And we come before the Lord and we, we bear our hearts and we, even if you're angry, you tell Him and God's a big God, He can handle it. I just want to, I want to tell you something. This will be a bold statement. Some of you won't like it, but I'm not afraid of you. And I don't mean that in a physical or natural way. I just, I just know this in my spirit so much that I, I can't be distracted. I can't, <laughs> I can't turn from this. But I've heard people talk about how mad they are at God. There's no way you can be mad at Him and know Him at the same time. 
there's no way that you can be mad at Him and know Him because He is absolutely good. God is love. God is a spirit. And God is an all-consuming fire. Those are the three descriptions that the Word gives us about who God is. God is love. God is a spirit. And God is an all-consuming fire. I don't know what those things blended together look like, but I'm going to spend all of eternity staring into it. We always think about the seraphim that the Bible talks about in in Isaiah chapter 6. The description of them, how majestic they must look. These creatures that fly around the throne of God. And they have eyes on the front of them and eyes on the back of them. And they fly around and, and God is there. And these majestic creatures are flying around the throne of God. And they're saying, holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The train of His robe fills the temple. And they're singing and, and they're, they're praising and they're worshiping. And here's what's crazy is we, we think about how majestic these seraphim must look, must appear when we see them, how crazy it's going to be. They've been looking at God for all eternity, and they think He's even more majestic. They're singing about how majestic He is, how holy He is. They're so obsessed with the presence of God that they can't stop flying around Him. They just want to stay there for forever. It's kind of like when God was telling Moses to move forward and go to the promised land. He says, go and my presence will go with you. He promises him that he will go with him. And the first thing that Moses says is, Lord, will you please go with us? Because if you don't go, I'm not interested in it. I'll stay in the wilderness with your presence before I go into the land of milk and honey without you. Like, I'll stay in the valley with the presence of the Lord and willingly sacrifice the mountaintop because He's that awesome. He's that powerful. He's that amazing. This morning, I just, I came here. Um, I, knew, I knew earlier this week that I would be preaching this morning. Pastor Pate, this isn't like a last-minute ordeal. So I, I did... I did come in with intentions this morning. You know, a lot of times we talk about coming to church with expectations. Well, it's really important for, for you all to come with expectations. But if there's a word that's supposed to be delivered, then whoever's called to deliver that word, and I think it could be more than just one person, but whoever's called to deliver that word should come with intention. So you come with expectation, I come with intention. And then when we leave the place today, flips. I leave with expectation and you leave with intention. You get it? All right, so we're going to have a little exchange this morning, okay? My intention this morning is to provoke you to live your life with a sense of urgency because we are very near the coming of the Lord. When I say that, I want you to understand the coming of the Lord is not going to take place until His bride is ready. Given that, the book of Revelation says that the bride has made herself ready. It's in Revelation 19 if you ever want to go read it. Okay, The bride has made herself ready. Is it okay if I just preach and quote the word to you? If, if every time I'm going to quote a scripture, I stop and read it out of the Bible, you guys will be here until like 4 o'clock today. Okay? And I can take it, but I don't know that you can. All right? The bride has made herself, everybody say, myself. Come on, say, myself, ready. See, Jeff's been talking about the armor of God. And we know that in Ephesians chapter 6, it says to put on the whole armor of God that you may be able to stand against the wiles of the devil, having done all to stand, stand. It goes on and talks about standing with the armor of God. See, the thing about the armor of God is, it's your responsibility to put it on. God has given it to you, 
It's almost like he's laid it out beside the bed for you in the morning so that when you wake up, it's yours for the taking, but you still have to have the perspective and the mindset of, if I leave the house without this today, I'll be completely exposed. By the way, if I'm going to accomplish the things that God wants me to accomplish in this day, then this armor is absolutely essential for me to have. If you look at the pieces of the armor of God, the armor of God prophesies warfare. You understand that? The armor of God itself prophesies warfare over your life. It prophesies that there's going to be conflict. There's going to be trials. There's going to be hard times. There's going to be people that come against you. There's going to be opposition. I pray that many people in the room today get delivered from the fear of people's faces, from the fear of what people say, from the fear of what people think about you. I pray that you get delivered today from a spirit of pressure, always needing to minister to be fulfilled to people, always needing to say the right thing to do the right thing you don't have to be anything but his to be effective in the kingdom of God and if you can just become his he'll do a whole lot more with you in his hand than he'll do than you can do with your own hands there's I heard it said before there's there's two kinds of people in the body of Christ there's workers and there's lovers and lovers will always get more things done than the workers because they do it from a place of relationship and not self-striving, not self-seeking. Can I be real? There's pastors standing behind pulpits all over our country, all over the world today, because they need to get a paycheck, because they want to fill up seats, because they want somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody to hear them on Facebook Live so that they can get an invitation into somebody who knows somebody who knows somebody's church. We have to be delivered from that mindset. We have to understand any man having put his hand to the plow and looking back is not fit for the kingdom. That's what it says, right? That's what Jesus said. Here's the thing. You all have your own plow. You all have your own field. And what I see happening so much is people are trying to plow other people's fields. Trying to till other people's grounds. Can I tell you what I love about intercession? I, I just It's my greatest calling right now. Can I tell you what I love about intercession? You won't like this. You're not here for it. It's just me and Him. And it's not that I don't love you. It's just that I'm absolutely in love with Him. And in that place of intercession, my plow and my field is revealed to me. See, if you don't ever get in the secret place you'll never hear God's secrets. But when you get into the secret place, you'll begin to hear the whispers and the secrets that God has in store for your life. And it's for you. It applies to you. And if we're going to be able to get the bride ready for the coming of the Lord and we want to hear His voice, then we're going to have to learn how to be isolated. And stop needing fulfillment from people around us. Stop needing other people to make us feel good. Look, look, Jesus, Jesus is teaching at the temple. And here come these Pharisees, man. These dudes come out of nowhere. All the time. Out of nowhere. Jesus is walking through a cornfield with his disciples. And the Pharisees show up. In a cornfield, man. What are they doing? They're so focused on His ministry that they're not applying any effort in their own. Maybe if they had just been doing what they were created to do 
instead of trying to disprove what Jesus was doing, their story would turn out a little different than it did. They bring this woman in who's caught in the act of adultery. They show up with her, and they all have their stones in their hand. And they're ready to just pound her for it. They're saying, according to the law of Moses, this woman was caught in the act of adultery. It's the, it's the law that she is stoned to death. So they all show up with rocks in their hand, ready to kill this woman. And I'm going to just... I'm going to quickly insert this because this will be a word for somebody. I can't tell the story without giving you this prophetic unction that's in my spirit right now. The people who thought they were bringing the woman to be murdered were actually bringing her to an encounter with Jesus. See, <laughs> that's like free. You didn't have to pay for that. You don't have to pay for any of it. I got it for free. You go get it for free. Amen? Come on, Miss Mary. Hallelujah. They show up thinking that they're leading her to her death, but they're actually leading her to life. You ought to thank God for the people that persecute you. You ought to thank God for the people that have been trying to push you over the edge. Listen, Peter, listen to this. Peter says, Jesus, don't go to Jerusalem. They'll kill you. They'll kill all of us. Don't do it. Jesus, we want to protect you. See, they wanted to protect the man. But the man understood that the mission was greater. So instead of him saying, Peter, I appreciate that, brother, but listen, there's something that God really wants me to do. And, and I'm going to need you to just chill out. He said, get behind me, Satan, to Peter. And I never read a place in Scripture where he apologized for it. It seems like the most offensive thing that could be said. But now, check this out. Here comes Judas with the Roman soldiers and his little bag of change. Can I? Okay, Lord. Too many people in the body of Christ have prostituted their callings for money. And I'm not just talking about preaching for a paycheck. I'm talking about working a job that you may have not, no business working. I'm talking about being a part of a company that you may ought not be a part of. But they give you a paycheck. So you do it anyway. Listen, there's a divine path. There's a path of favor for God's people. You can get on it. You can not get on it. Let me tell you something. I'm not into striving for the next level. I'm into being faithful on the level I'm on. And if I'm faithful here, the Bible says plainly that He's going to reward me with more. So I refuse to be dissatisfied. Because godliness with contentment, does anybody know this scripture that's in the word of the Lord? Godliness with contentment is what? Great gain. Who said it? Come on, girl. Wow. Godliness with contentment is great gain. I want to be godly and I want to be content where I am. Why? Because I'm in love with him. Did you hear that? Not because I want to get to the next level. He's going to take me to the next level because he's that good. I'm just going to be content and godly and faithful where I am because I love him. Like that's enough for me. We need to be delivered from this self-seeking mentality, this perspective. So anyway, here comes Judas. Y'all thought I got off track, didn't you? I did, actually. 
here comes Judas with the Roman soldiers and his change purse. And Jesus looks at him. And you know what he says? He says, Judas, friend, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss? Wait a minute. Friend? Really? See, I know your flesh wants to believe that was sarcasm. But I believe it was absolutely sincere. Judas, friend, betrayest thou the Son of Man with a kiss. So the one who's trying to protect him, he calls a devil. But the one who's trying to push him into his destiny, which is the crucifixion and resurrection, the hope of glory for all mankind, he calls him his friend. Maybe we need to just be delivered from only hanging out with people that are nice to us. I love being around them. They just make me feel so good about myself. <laughs> just make me feel so good. Look, they show up to stone that woman in front of Jesus. And Jesus doesn't go, wait, whoa, whoa. Come on now. Let's all just love each other. He did what love does. Somebody's going to like this. He did what love does. He spoke truth. If we're going to have revival in our churches, if we're going to have revival in America, then we need truth behind our pulpits. We need truth in our pews. We need truth on the worship team. We need truth on the welcome team because there's no room for compromise in the calling of the harvest that God is wanting to give into the hands of the church. There's no room for compromise. I woke up in my hotel room about, I don't know, this is probably a year and a half ago. The Lord told me to share this with you this morning. All week, He's reminded me every day that I have to tell you this story. So please listen. I woke up in my hotel room about a year and a half ago. I was in Charlotte, North Carolina working. And uh, when I woke up, the Lord took me into a dream. I know that sounds crazy, but that's exactly what happened. I woke up, and the Lord took me into a dream immediately. Like I didn't have time to say no. I woke up. And I opened my eyes, and all of a sudden, I was eight years old again. And I was riding in the back of a Jeep to a courthouse in Weedowie, Alabama. <laughs> and I don't, know if my, I don't know if my uncle watches this on Facebook Live, but he had broke the law, right, Pops? He was fishing without a fishing license. It wasn't that big of a deal, but it was a big deal. It was big enough he had to go to court. Had to be judged over it, right? I woke up. I mean, I, I opened my eyes, and I'm, I'm eight years old again, and I'm in the back of this Jeep, and I'm driving a weed out, and I remember the top being, I'm telling you, like I relived this encounter in my bed, okay? It was that real. The top was off the Jeep. I could feel the wind hitting me in the face. I could hear my uncle's heavy metal music playing. It was like, it was so real. And I remember in the vision that the Lord was giving me, we walked into the courthouse, and there was a line of people in the hall. And all we were supposed to do was show up, pay the ticket, and leave. But we couldn't get into the courtroom because there was a hearing going on. So we were standing in the hall of the courtroom waiting for the hearing to be over with. And so as a little kid, I'm eight years old, I'll never forget this now. 
I'm standing there with my dad and my uncle, and we're just waiting. And all of a sudden, I hear this gruesome, like heart-shattering screaming coming from the courtroom. And it, like in my vision, I could hear it like it was in the room. It was real. And I could hear all this commotion, and I could hear all this screaming. And, and it was this girl who was probably 14 or 15 years old. I don't know what she had done. It doesn't matter. But she was found guilty. And they were dragging her out of the courtroom. She's kicking. She's screaming. Bloody murder screaming just as loud and, and, and raw as you can imagine. They're dragging her out of the courtroom. And she's saying one word over and over and over again. She's screaming it from the top of her lungs. One word. Do you know what the word was? Mama. And the mom was in the courtroom and could do nothing to save her daughter because it was too late. And I woke up and I said, Lord, why are you showing me this? What is this about? He said, that's what it's going to look like, Gary, on the great and terrible day of the Lord. People will be screaming my name and I love those people. But they rejected my son. And on that day, I won't be able to help them. I won't be able to save them. I won't be able to do anything for them. It'll be too late. They'll be crying out for me. Look, on the great and terrible day of the Lord, the Bible says that they'll be saying, they did all these things, they're crying out, Lord, Lord, we did this, we did this, we did this. Lord, and He will say, depart from Me, you workers of iniquity, for I never knew you. So many times I hear people in the church that are saying, I wish the Lord would just come back. I wish the Lord would just... You have no idea how much it's going to break His heart on that day. You have no idea how much hurt He's going to have inside of Him on that day. When His creation has rejected Him. And they are forced to be drug out, screaming, kicking, crying His name. And because God is so good, He's bound by His Word. He's bound by His Word. He will be able to do nothing to save them. So He's asked us to do it. He's given His ministry over to us, to His bride, to His church, to carry His anointing, to carry His calling, to carry His mantle, to do the things that He wants us to do so that on that great and terrible day of the Lord, we won't have to be witnesses of people who were crying out for a God that they never took the time to know. But we could actually introduce people to their Savior. I'm talking about a straight up, real, thorough, born again, Holy Ghost filled, repentance, sanctification revival that I know in my heart is about to hit our land. And we have to be positioned to steward the outpour. Can I tell you what happened to me yesterday morning? I woke up, and I know when I, when I tell stories, people are like, man, God must just talk to you every day. Yeah, He does. I listen to what He's saying. That's why He talks to me. I listen to Him. My favorite part of prayer is listening. I love to listen. Seek ye first to understand, then to be understood. Why don't we try that for a while? 
What if coming before the Lord wasn't you pouring out all of your petty issues? What if coming before the Lord became, God, what is your heart today? What do you want? I sat on the balcony of my hotel a few weeks ago, and I said, Lord, I just want to be yielded. Teach me, Holy Spirit, how to be yielded. And the Holy Spirit told me, He said, until I say otherwise, I want you to approach God on His terms and His terms alone. Approach Him only to know Him. Approach Him to know His goodness, to ask for His nature to be revealed to you. Changed my prayer life. So many times when we go into prayer, we make it all about us. We need to make it all about Him. We need to learn. We need to learn how to listen Yesterday morning, I woke up and the Lord said, this blew my mind, okay? Can I just be real with you for a minute? This blew my mind. The Lord said, I know you told me not to say that. It blows my mind, Jeff. But he does. He blew my mind. He said, I am about, yeah. He said, I am about to send you the anointing of Deborah. I said, Deborah, who? I'm like, Deborah? Is she kin to Esther? Like, I don't know anything about Deborah, Lord. He's like, let's get in the Word. Let's check out what it says. Holy Spirit's like, come on, I'm going to show you some stuff. I'm going to teach you about Deborah. Because I'm about to send her anointing to you for you to steward. And I found out that Deborah (laughs) was a woman who was appointed to rule for God over the people of Israel after they had been sold into captivity into the hands of Jabin. And she was the ruler over God's people during the time that they were released. And she did not waver. She did not falter. But she was a woman of boldness. She was a woman of power. The Bible says that she would sit under a palm tree I didn't know none of this stuff before yesterday morning, man. This is so cool. She would sit, she would sit under a palm tree, and people would come to her for wisdom. People, she ruled from this palm tree. Palm tree. You remember it was the branches of palm trees that were laid on the ground when Jesus went into Jerusalem because palm branches represent victory. They represent uprightness. They represent righteousness. She would sit under this palm tree between. Man, I love this. Between the city of Bethel and the city of Ramah. And Bethel is the house of God. That's what it means. Ramah means the high place, but it's also the birthplace of Samuel the prophet. So she would rule. This is a woman. She would rule from between the house of God and the birthplace of prophets. What if we had women like that in the kingdom? Women like that in the church that would rise up. She was so powerful that men would come to her for their marching orders. And it was God ordained. He said, I'm sending you the anointing of Deborah. Why, Lord? Why? Why me? You know what he said? I mean, I'm like, Lord, I'm already doing a lot. Like, Lord, I don't know if you know this or not, but like I do catalyst and unction. I'm associate pastor, and director for Southwire. Like I, Lord, I, you, you say, you know, depart from me for I never knew you. I just want you to know me. Like I got some stuff going on already. So why me? So because I know I can trust you with it. That was at 5.30 yesterday morning. 6 o'clock yesterday morning, I get a message from a Deborah. She doesn't know she's a Deborah yet, but she is. So God confirms in the natural what's been revealed in the Spirit. He's so good, y'all. He's so good. This whole Christianity thing is such an adventure. Let me tell you, 
A lot of people think Christianity is about going to church and worshiping and getting preached to. And all. Christianity is about your children knocking on the door of your closet. Daddy, what are you doing in there? Daddy, what's that language you're speaking in? Daddy, why are you crying? Come on in, son. I'll show you. Let's talk about it. Christianity is hearing the voice of God and being obedient. Look, I know we have people that like show up for, for Catalyst and help out and they bring stuff, but how cool is it? If you were a part of the intercession that went on before the last Catalyst, would you just raise your hand real quick if you came for one of the intercession meetings? Yeah. How cool is it that the Lord's like, take the baptistry? The Lord's like, do a prayer request box. You know? The Lord's like, just saying things for us to do. And it's just simple obedience that brings favor on us. But if you're not in intercession, if you're not in the secret place, you don't get in on that stuff. It's so cool to see it. Do you remember? Are you okay? You good? Do you remember the first miracle of Jesus? It's so prophetic. So prophetic. The first miracle of Jesus. Jesus goes into the wedding of Cana. And there's six water pots there that are empty, right? And so they run out of wine, and so they come to Jesus, and they're like, hey, we're out of wine. So Jesus goes over there to the water pots. I love this, because there's six empty water pots. Six being the number of mankind. Mankind was created on the sixth day. Jesus says, take the water and fill the water pots up to the brim. Water being a representation in Scripture of the Holy Ghost. So he says, take these six pots, which are a representation of mankind, because there's six of them there. Man was created on the sixth day. Fill them up with water, which is the equivalent in Scripture to the Holy Ghost, and then begin to serve the people who are here. And I just know the servants had to be like, what? They're out of wine, Jesus. They got water. I wonder, like I really wonder, if you're willing to look stupid. I'm serious. I'm serious. Because sometimes dying to yourself is getting on your knees in a public place and laying hands on a sick person. I mean, like out at Chocolate Park, with people walking around you. What are they doing? Don't worry about it. She'll be healed in a second. Like the whole dying daily thing. I wonder if we're really able to, are willing to, to press into that because that's where obedience is derived from. Obedience is derived from your willingness to die daily. So you know the story. Pour the water into the wine pots. Pour it out. It becomes something brand new. So prophetic because whenever God's people are filled with the Holy Spirit and they are poured out, they become something brand new, transfigured, transformed, a brand new life being poured out. It's amazing. Absolutely amazing. God is doing something so significant in the earth right now. I've heard prophets, I've heard men, I've heard evangelists, all kind of people say that what God wants to do in the earth right now has never been done before. I'm talking about a mass revival, okay? Do y'all even want that? Does that sound, are you, are you into that kind of thing? Are you into souls being saved? Are you into people being healed? Are you into lives being changed? Are you into getting outside the walls of the church and actually being effective with the life that God has given you to steward? Okay? Are you, are you into that kind of thing? Are you excited about it? Do you have passion in your heart to change the world, or do you have passion in your heart to go eat lunch right now? What are you passionate about? What are you hungriest for, maybe, is the more appropriate question. This revival that I believe God wants to release is only going to come through intercession. It's going to come through prayer. We've been talking about prayer for so long. It's going to come. I heard it all week long. I just came out of a conference in South Carolina. Thousands of people there. It was amazing. I heard this. It was a common theme. Bend the church 
save the world. The world will not be saved until the church becomes bent. What do I mean by bent? I mean on your face, on your knees, crying for lives to be changed, crying out for God to send a wave of revival, for God to send fire, for God to send His wind, for God to send a third awakening to America, for God to send a movement of the Holy Spirit that leaves lives completely wrecked and transformed in the name of Jesus, a wave of the Holy Spirit that ushers in healing, that ushers in power, that ushers in freedom in the Holy Ghost, a wave of the Holy Spirit that crushes religion, that shakes the, the foundations and the core of denominational separation and belief that actually comes in and uproots belief systems that have been intact for years that keep people inside of structural boxes in their churches and never allow them to see or experience or walk in the fullness and freedom of Jesus Christ. We could experience the greatest revival the world has ever seen. But the strategy for that to happen is going to come through the secret place. I'm telling you. That's why, listen to me, this will be the most prophetic thing I say all morning. You pay attention, you watch this because it's happening all over the world. That's why you'll no longer be able to put your finger on who's a prophet, who's an evangelist, who's a preacher, who's a teacher. You won't be able to tell a difference anymore. Why? Because God is turning the platforms of America over to the intercessors. And when you get in the vein of intercession where heaven comes to earth, you get in the vein of all five offices. So all of a sudden, you got a little bit of evangelist in you. You got a little bit of prophet in you. You got a little bit of preacher in you. You got a little bit of teacher in you. You got a little bit. It's, it's a blended nature. This, I'm telling you, God is creating like hybrid believers right now that are raised, being raised up to discern the times that we're in, to be able to foresee the things that are coming, and to carry something that goes beyond anything that the Lord has ever done in the earth. I believe with all my heart, Jesus said that we would do greater things. We are going to do greater things. That's a promise of the Lord. That's not arrogance. People say, you're so arrogant praying for, for power. What are you going to do when you get power? Why do you need power? Why do you need power? Why do you want power? Why do you want power? I'll tell you why. Because Jesus said you sit your butt down in the upper room and you don't go anywhere until you get it. That's why. I don't want power so that I can be something. I want power because He's called me to do something. Go and tarry in Jerusalem and wait. You wait there. You wait in that place. You wait in that upper room. You sit there and you seek my face. You seek my presence. You fast. You pray. You intercede for your country. And when I want to, bam, I'll release my mantle, my power. It'll be upon you to go out and change the world. We talk about waves of fire and wind and tongues and all these different things, but there's no intercession to usher it into the earth. I knew this would be the response I would get. I knew it. I knew it. I don't understand why it's so hard. I don't understand why it's so hard for people to intercede, for people to get on their faces before the Lord, for people to cry out. Beware, church. Beware in these final days for self-seeking religion. Beware of comfort-driven religion. Where it's all about how, comfort you, how comfortable you can be, how blessed you can be, how successful you can be. Beware of this vain philosophy that's going to spew out of the mouth of lukewarm pastors. I just went in a job interview. And somebody asked me a question. In your work life, how do you feel about this? In your work life, how do you feel about this? In your work life, how do you feel about this? Wait, wait a minute. Wait a minute, what? What do you mean in my work life? This is a job interview, okay? What do you mean in my work life? Like, like you want me to be different here than I am at home with my family? I mean... Where I'm from, they call that hypocrisy. 
And the last time I checked, those people don't inherit the kingdom of God. Woe unto you hypocrites. No more of Christianity only when it's comfortable to us. I don't want to be preaching right now because I see on some of your faces that you want to leave so bad right now you can't stand it. But I refuse to be distracted and thrown off of the assignment that God has put me on to stir your hearts and provoke you into a place of boldness to usher in what God wants to do in the earth. I like, I want you to like me. Don't get me wrong. But if you don't, I'm cool with that too. But I refuse to be something that I'm not at any point in my life. Well, you know, you can't, you can't do that kind of stuff at work, brother. Are you crazy? I've called supervisors in the back offices and laid hands on them. I don't care. See, the problem with most of the people in the church is you believe those lies. And the adversary has us afraid instead of walking and living in the boldness of Jesus Christ. You can see Jesus with that woman, all the Pharisees with their rocks. Wait, fellas, wait, wait, wait. Come on now, surely we can reach some kind of agreement here. Stop negotiating with the adversary. There's a prophetic word for you. Stop negotiating with the adversary. Stop trying to make it work for you and him. Come out from among them and be ye separate, says the Lord. You're not supposed to look like they look. You're not supposed to say what they say. You're not supposed to do what they do. You're supposed to be a flame and fire in the hands of an almighty God that burns with righteousness and holy indignation. So why don't you step into that reality and be that individual and carry the torch that God wants to place in your hand. I said it at the last recovery service. I'll close with this. I don't know, I think you get three or four closings before you're a liar. I'll close with this. How many of you saw the movie The Apostle Paul? How many of you thought it was so dis, like, disheartening, disruptive, it, it just like, it hurt you, it made you sick? When you saw them, are you listening to me? When you saw them, pour oil on the believers, set them on fire while they were alive, and then nail their bodies to poles over the city, and they actually use them as torches. What if I told you that their heart was, even in death, they would become a light for the world to see? What if we just got before God in our closets and said, pour your oil on me and set me on fire and let me burn. Let me burn for everybody that is around me to see. Let me burn with holiness. Let me burn with fire. Let me burn with passion. I know, I know faith without works is dead, but works without passion is just work. And it leads to exhaustion be so much better if we could just burn for him and let the world see. Second closing. Jesus said, when I pour out my spirit upon you, you shall be witnesses unto who? Unto who? Unto me. Unto me. I don't know that we even understand what that looks like in the body of Christ anymore. We get so caught up in being witnesses to people. We take very little time to minister unto the Lord. A 
Like, I don't say this in condemnation, man. But I get convicted over, like, watching football games and seeing people get so passionate and seeing people run and yell and scream and clap and come to church and look like death in a seat. I get so convicted about driving by Talladega Super Speedway and people camp out for a week to watch pieces of metal go in circles. But yet there's so many empty seats in here this morning. Because we don't hunger for the things of God. It's broken perspective, church. It's broken perspective. (sighs) Last closing, stand on your feet. I don't need the band or anything this morning. I appreciate it. I already put them through enough torture earlier. I just want to... I'm going to pray for you. The way I believe God wants me to pray for you this morning. If you don't like what I say, you don't have to receive it. But if you want to go where God's calling us to, you will. So, Father, I pray for restlessness. I pray for dreams and visions that wake up your church in the middle of the night. I pray for more wrestling in the kingdom. I pray, Lord, for more people who are willing to wake up in the morning and strap on your armor. And at the same time, Lord, I pray for more people who are willing to take their armor off and be a laid down lover with you. People who are willing to go beyond comfort in their intimacy with you. Holy Spirit, I pray for conviction over convenience. I pray for righteousness over right standing with other people. I pray for power over complacency. And I pray, God, that you would send out laborers. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. That you would send out laborers into the fields that would go after this harvest, God that would wake up with fire in their bellies. Woo! Men and women that burn for you. God, raise up more Jeremiah's. Raise up the Deborah's, God. Raise up those kind of mantles, those kind of anointings, those kind of callings, Father. Raise up prophets. Raise up evangelists. Raise up preachers and teachers. And God, the people that, uh, that need to be interceding, I pray that you would send a great, <laughs> a great unsettling, Lord, in their spirit that draws them into a secret place with you. I pray for a fresh baptism of the Holy Ghost. One that is authentic and sincere. I pray for tongues, for interpretation of tongues. I pray for discernment. I pray for faith. I pray for healing God. I pray for the fruit of the Spirit to come 
for love, for joy, for peace, for patience, for kindness, for goodness, for gentleness, and for self-control. Lord, I thank You. I thank You that self-control is not a fruit of self, but it's a fruit of Your Holy Spirit. And we need that. We need that, God. Burn within our hearts. Burn within our lives. Set our homes on fire for You. Set our children on fire for You. I bind every spirit of addiction over teenagers, over young adults, over adults, over children. I, I bind in the name of Jesus these little addictions that seem insignificant because everyone else is doing it. We break that mindset in the name of Jesus because we refuse to do what everyone else is doing. We refuse to blend in. We're not going to stick out like a sore thumb. We're going to stick out like a healed thumb on a sore hand. We refuse, Lord, to settle for the status quo of the world. We want Your power, God. We want Your winds to blow in our sanctuaries, God. We want our hearts to be filled with righteousness, with repentance, with fire, to go out and change the world for the glory of God. No more addiction. No more addiction to ministry, says the Lord. Too many people have found their identity in ministry. No more addiction to ministry. Only addiction to His presence. Only addiction to His presence. We will be satisfied in knowing You because godliness with contentment is great gain. Thank You, Father, for Your people. They're amazing. And I love them so much, God. Fill them today. In your holy name I pray. Amen. Amen. It was a privilege to have you as our special guest today. Thank you for joining us at Life Worship Center. Now, our ministry is supported by the generosity of people just like you. Please consider giving today online by clicking on the link of our website, lifewc.org. Thank you for making a difference in the lives of others. And until next time, God bless.